All right, hello everyone, and welcome to the Newark Museum of Arts Stargazing Program. My name is Mary Hiller, and today we are joined by April Witt of the Fernbank Science Center, who is going to show us amazing views of the night sky. We are also joined by Shelley from Language Years, who will be providing ASL interpretation throughout the program, and Imani Lee Hector, our program producer here at the Newark Museum of Art. So we'd like to thank the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs and you, our audiences, who helped make our programs possible. So tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce April Witt. April has served as astronomy instructor at Fernbank Science Center since 1994 and as educator fellow with NASA's messenger mission to Mercury, the New Horizons flyby of Pluto, and most recently as Airborne Astronomy Ambassador with NASA's Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. So if you have questions for April, you can type them into the Q&A section on Zoom that you can find at the bottom of your screen or at, on the side or on the top, depending upon what uh, technology you're using to watch us tonight. Or if you're watching us on Facebook, you can put your questions in the comments section as well. Please don't submit your question multiple times. We will try to get through as many questions as possible with this program. So without further ado, April, the stage is yours. April, I'm sorry, you're muted. Can you unmute yourself? Sorry, I know That's better okay. than that. <laughs> That's all right. Welcome everybody. And thanks very much for coming in part of this this evening. Um, as Mary said, my name is April Witt. And to be honest, I retired from Fernbank Science Center at the end of last year. So I, but I did get to work with the Ralph Weiss Memorial Observatory for a good long time. It has a really nice telescope in it. And if the PowerPoint goes along, Fernbank Science Center is part of the DeKalb County School System near Atlanta, Georgia. So because we're part of the school system, we get a lot of students who come for lessons in the planetarium and also to use the observatory. This is our front entrance during the summertime. Um, this weekend starts the Atlanta Science Festival. So we're going to be having lots of visitors, or at least we hope we'll be able to have a lot of them. On the next slide, you can see some of our students, I believe. There's a, oh, the planetarium itself. We are, um, Classic, perhaps would be the polite term. It's a Zeiss Mark VI planetarium projector. So it uses uh, lenses and lights and it's that there's also a digital projection system that was added a couple of years ago. Um, the students who come in the next image, we have a program called STT Science Tools and Techniques. Ninth graders from the DeKalb County Schools can come for a semester of their ninth grade year. They spend it at the uh, couple of hours every morning at the science center doing all kinds of science, botany and astronomy and geology and every kind of micro whatever we have to offer. So um, we are used by students a lot. Um, the general public is also uh, invited. The observatory itself is up on one sort of end of the building. Um, this is the dome of it. The telescope inside is a 36 inch reflector. Um, telescopes, at least the kind you look through, they're the kind with lenses like spy glasses. Those are called refracting telescopes. The other kind are reflecting telescopes and those use a large mirror to gather the light. I think that might be about it unless we have an image of the, yeah, there we are. Um, for scale, that's uh, somebody looking through the eyepiece of the main 36 inch telescope. Um, the big bunch of metal down there at the bottom is sort of a counterweight. It's a big instrument and it tracks beautifully. So we've been able, when it was first installed in the, um, 1967, it was used for research. Atlanta was much smaller. It was much less light pollution in the 50 something years since then, the lights of the city have just gotten too bright. There's too much sky glow. So we're not really doing much, at least, visual astronomy anymore, at least not much research. I think that might be the last slide on those. We have been, <laughs> unfortunately, because we're part of the school system, when the school system shut down for the pandemic, 
Um, we, we didn't allow, we're not allowed to have anybody in the building or in the observatory. So um, uh, Dr. Harris, one of our astronomy people, um, did planetarium programs on Zoom, <laughs> sort of a good bunch of stuff all together. So that's hopefully in the past, we'll be open for using the real sky in the observatory and using our planetarium sky as well. Okay. And Mary, do we have a sky to look at? Yes, yes, we do. So allow me to share my screen. All right. So we are set up for 7.30 p.m. this evening. Okay. I don't know about you guys. Well, okay. I grew up out in the country and could see the sky like this as a child. Of course, that area is all light polluted now, too. But it used to be able, you could... A hundred years ago, even anybody could walk out their back door and look up into the sky and actually see stars. That's really difficult to do nowadays. Most of us in America live in cities. Most of the city light that's bleeding up into the sky kind of washes out what's up there. And particularly if it's cloudy or rainy or snowing or something, you can't see the stars at all. But look at this image. This is if you're outside, pretend you've gone outside and you're facing south. If you're not sure which way is south, think about which way the sun went down and that put that on your right hand side and that will be west and you'll be facing the direction south. And if you look on this image, pretend that you're looking about halfway up in the sky and see if you can find three stars, little dots that make a line on the sky, the belt of Orion the Hunter. Thanks, Mary. Mm -hmm. And indeed, I mean, even from my light polluted backyard, when it's not covered with clouds, I can see those three stars and a little higher on the sky, there are two more stars. This is where you have to use your imagination. There are two, one kind of brightish, Betelgeuse, and the other one, not quite so bright, the shoulders for Orion the Hunter. Those three stars in a row are his belt. There are two more stars a little lower down toward the horizon for knees. Use your imagination here. And if you can find that pattern, and the thing of it is, if you hold up your thumb and you measure on the screen, mm, it doesn't look so big, but this thing is big. When you go outside and look, you have to look wide across the sky and tall. It's a tall constellation. So you're outside, you're facing south, you have found the three stars in Orion's belt. And if you draw a line, I would say up or toward the west, there's a reddish colored star at the top end of a little V shape of stars. The little V shape is the head of Taurus the bull. So we have a hunter mm -hmm. and we have a bull and a little higher on the sky, uh, see if you can find, it looks like a teeny, teeny, teeny little dipper or a little clump of stars, the Pleiades. See if you can find those. There you go. Good. Now, if you were outside and you had a really dark sky, this is where you get to do some measuring. Hold your left arm straight up over your head, lock your elbow straight. Okay, now make a fist with your left hand and stick up just your pinky finger. If we were in the planetarium or outside in a dark sky, you could move your arm over and cover up the Pleiades, that little clump of stars with just the tip of your pinky finger. It's about half a degree across on the sky. So we have a hunter with shoulders and knees. We have a bull with a reddish eye. And we have Pleiades, a little cluster of stars, a little bit farther on. In the wintertime, for us in the Northern Hemisphere, these groupings of stars are easy to find because it is, they're really bright stars and they fill up the whole south part of the sky. As Earth moves along our orbit in the next couple of weeks when we come to the spring equinox, we'll still be able to see those stars for a little bit in the early evening, but 
if you can, keep an eye on where they are. If you go outside the same time every night for a couple of weeks and watch, you'll notice that as the weeks go along, those sets of stars, every evening, the whole thing is going to be a little bit farther toward the west. Earth is moving along our orbit all the time, so things are going to change. By May, those stars will be in the same part of the sky that the sun is, so they'll be up during the daytime. So we won't be able to see them. We'll have to wait until the next fall to see them again. Okay, let's go back to those three stars on Orion's belt. And this time, you're gonna draw your line in the opposite direction down toward the horizon and see if you can find the brightest star in the whole nighttime sky. Sometimes it's called the dog star or Sirius. And if you have a fabulous imagination, it's in the constellation of the big dog. I usually think of it as the end of the dog's nose. Sometimes it's the tag on its collar and there are stars down a little bit farther that, oh good, thank you, that have, um, make the legs and the tail, back legs and a couple of stars for the front legs. And Sirius is relatively close as far as stars go. Something that took me a long time to figure out is when you look up at the sky, you're essentially looking 3D. Each of those stars is a different distance from us here on Earth. So the sun is a star, we know that. And that one's really close. And the light coming from the sun only takes about eight minutes to get here to the earth. Eight minutes doesn't seem like really long, right? Unless you have to be in pain or wait for something eight minutes, then it seems like a really long time. In fact, if the sun were to wink out for some unknown reason right now, we wouldn't even know it until eight minutes had gone by and it was dark. So the sun is about eight minutes away in um, light years, a measure of distance. Sirius is about eight, eight light years away from us. The sun is only light minutes away, uh, light years. Uh, it sounds like a measurement of time, but it's actually a measurement of distance. How far does light travel in one year? Then you gotta go back and do the math, right? How fast does light move? Mm, 186,000 miles per second times 60 seconds in a minute, times 60 minutes in an hour, times 24 hours in a day, times 365 and a little bit days in a year. Now you've got a number with lots and lots of zeros. It's about 6 trillion miles is one light year. Sirius is about eight light years away. And that's close by. A lot of the other things that are up in that section of the sky are much farther away from Earth. So what if you could get up really close to one of those things that looks kind of dim? I'll bet if you got up really close, it would look really, really bright. It looks dim because it's far, far away from us. A lot of the little things. Okay, we have a hunter. We have a dog. We have a bull. If we were to look at a bull with a red eye, start on that... Um, star in the dog's nose, Sirius, and then draw a line across to the knee of Orion. The star's name is Rigel. And then draw a line up to the bull's eye. There we go. And now we're going to go even higher on the sky. Pay no attention to that blotch of light. We'll get to that in a second. Uh oh. Other way. <laughs> I, I might have to re oh, readjust okay. it for one second. Give me one <laughs> sure. second here. Let's actually clear those drawings. Let's reposition ourselves. Okay. And let's bring this up a little bit higher and zoom out ever so slightly. There we go. So now if you were outside, your head would be tipped way back because you'd be looking way high in the sky. Sirius over to Rigel and then up to Aldebaran, and then ignore the moon for a second. And just past the moon, a little bit higher at the top of the sky, is a bright star called Capella. It's in Auriga, the charioteer, uh, sort of a pentagon of stars up there. 
Now draw a little bit over. There are two stars that look like twins. There they are. The Gemini twins, you might've heard of those, that zodiac constellation, Castor and Pollux. The way I remember them is Castor is on the same side as Capella and Pollux is on the same side as Procyon, the last of those stars in our little winter circle here or winter hexagon, I guess if you have a good imagination. This covers a huge piece of the sky. So if you're going to go outside and look, it'll be, um, you'll have to look at a really big piece of the sky, like half the sky to see it. Are there any questions about any of this so far? I will go to chat. There's lots of chat going on here. Let's see, do we have any questions? Oh, somebody remembering the Newark Museum has the same type of planetarium projector. There are not many of us left. They're very large and <laughs> those are kind of old. <laughs> it's harder to find parts and people to take care of it. Okay, let me check Q&A here. And nothing yet, okay. Okay, let's look at that elephant in the room then, the bright, bright splotch. And if we can zoom in a little bit, and look at the moon. There we go. And I understand it's snowing in Newark. It's <laughs> raining here. So I can't see the moon for real outside. But if we zoom in a little bit more, there we go. OK. If you have ever seen a full moon, Raise your hand. Good, okay. If you've ever seen like a half a moon, almost like what this one looks like. And if you look at the curved edge of the moon, the limb of the moon, yeah. When you look at that edge, that gives you a clue as to where the sun is. If you think about that curved moon as like a curved bow, like a bow and arrow, the arrow is shooting out of the curve and it's pointing toward the sun. So in this image, it looks like it would point down toward the bottom right of the screen. Yeah, the sun is down there somewhere. So if you have ever, if you just see the moon sometime, you can tell where the sun is in relation to it by which side of the moon is lit up. This is a waxing moon, waxing crescent, almost a first quarter moon. And First quarter moon to me looks like half a moon. It's where the moon is in its orbit around the earth. And as the moon moves every night, it's gonna be in a little bit different place every night across the background stars. So if we zoom out, can we zoom out a little bit to where we were before and look at where the moon is in relation to Orion and Aldebaran and the bull, okay. So here's tonight. And if we go outside tomorrow night at the same time, say 7.30, and look up at the sky, pretending that there are no clouds in the way, see where the moon will be tomorrow night at this same time. Aha. So it has moved a little bit toward the east. And if it goes one more night, even farther toward the east. So it started there near Aldebaran and Taurus the bull. Now it's moving toward the Gemini twins. And in another night or two, it will have passed them and moved along Gemini and um, Taurus zodiac constellation names. If you ever go looking for the moon, it's always going to be in the south part of the sky. You're never gonna find the moon up around the North Star. The moon, the other planets, the sun, they all seem to travel across a band of sky. The, the ecliptic, the, <laughs> it's called that because eclipses happen there. Imagine that the earth is a hollow globe. You know, like a globe when you were a kid and it has latitude and longitude lines on it. Okay, now put a light bulb into the earth and shine those latitude and longitude lines out onto the sky. 
<clears throat> that's one way of mapping the sky. And there would be a line up across the zodiac stars where the moon would follow that during a month, um, the sun would follow it during a year, planets move along there, along their orbits. It's the plane of Earth's orbit out in space. So if we watch, can we back up again to where to tonight? We've gone forward in time, let's get younger. There we are, okay. So a waxing moon means it's getting bigger. Every night it's a little bit fatter. If we could look at it up close when we're moving along like that, each night it will be a little further toward the east and a little bit fatter looking until it gets to full moon phase. And on that day, the moon rise, full moon rises just as the sun is setting. Okay, anybody have any questions about the moon? Check in the chat here. There we go, good, somebody's found Stellarium, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, nothing in the Q&A yet, okay. Okay, let us then, let's change places. Let's go back to Orion for a minute. And look, if we can zoom in actually on Orion a bit. <clears throat> And look at those two stars that are supposed to be shoulders. There's a reddish orangey one, Betelgeuse. And then there's another, I think that one's safe. Am I right? Bellatrix. Bellatrix, sorry. Safe Bellatrix, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. Those two for the shoulders. Mm -hmm. Knees, we've got Rigel and safe. And on the left-hand edge of the belt, of Orion, those three stars, there's a little hunting knife hanging down and there's a little clump of stars. If you're outside in a really dark environment and you've got binoculars, check this out. This is an area where there is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, where there's a nebula, a cloud of dust and gas in space. The area of the sky where Orion is, that constellation has just about everything possible in stellar life cycles. That reddish star, Betelgeuse, is a, an old, a red giant star toward the end of its life. The <clears throat> blue-white star, Rigel, down by his feet, healthy young star. Ah, but the baby star, the nursery of baby stars is in that nebula, the Orion Nebula, sometimes called. Stellarium is really good at zooming in. And you've probably seen pictures of this. This is really popular for people with little telescopes to look at or with decent binoculars to look at. So you can find the Orion Nebula. And I think the horse head is down at the bottom there, isn't it? Can we zoom in a little bit? There's another nebula. That, the Orion Nebula is glowing. It gives off light. The, little, the young stars, just a few million years old, are exciting the atoms and the gas and dust and making the whole thing glow. There are other nebulas that are dark. They're against a dark, or they're against a, a bright background. So there we are. Looks like a horse head or the Loch Ness monster. A cloud, a dark cloud. This is where astronomers have kind of a difficult time if you're looking at light because there are a lot of these clouds out there in space and we can't see through them with just eyes or the kind of light detection. That's where radio astronomy comes in and infrared astronomy, different satellites and instruments that look at different wavelengths. You can learn a whole lot just by looking at a different wavelength. So those two are nebulas that are right near that uh, part of the sky where Orion is. Good. Questions on those? See chat. Okay. Moon appeared super low in the sky really late at night on Monday. Good question. What accounts for that? It was probably just rising. As the different times of year, the moon appears to be different heights in the sky. I know when I was a kid in uh, Western New York, when it would snow in the wintertime, the full moon in the winter is really high in the sky and it would just flood the whole snowy landscape with moonlight. It was cold, but it was really cool. And then during the summertime, <clears throat> excuse me, during the summertime, at least here in the Northern hemisphere, 
The full moon doesn't get very high above the horizon, so it kind of scoots along low. That ecliptic that we were talking about, that depends, again, where the Earth is along its orbit. You'll see um, the moon and things, the ecliptic itself, at different heights in the sky. So that could be why the moon appeared kind of low on Monday. Let's see, how many, why are there so many nebulas? That is a really good question. We didn't have people standing around with video cameras at the beginning when things were just forming. So our best, we just have to do our best guess. Space is really, really, really big. There's lots and lots of stuff, but most of space is just empty. So there are places for nebulas, there are places for stars. That's a good question though. Why are there so many? April? Ma'am? Hi, April. Um, I have some questions that are popping up in the Q&A and I'm just gonna, um, if you don't mind, I can just come and um, ask you a couple of them. Sure, I just got to there actually, go ahead. All right, so um, I have a question. It says, how is it possible that the moon cannot rotate? That's the tricky part. The moon does rotate but it rotates at the same rate that it revolves around the earth. So if you were to stand, say, where the Apollo astronauts landed, some of them, that's on what we call the near side of the moon. And if you were to watch the moon go all the way around the earth one time, you would always see the earth. That side is always facing the earth, but from say new moon to full moon, halfway around its orbit, it has turned, but at the same rate that it's moving around. So the moon does rotate, but we only see one side of it. I'm trying to think if there's a good analogy for that. Like if you put a bowl of flowers in the middle of a round dining room table, and then you stand watching the flowers and you revolve, move around the dining room table, always facing the flowers. As you go around the table, you're also rotating. I mean, if you stop and measure yourself at different places, you are actually turning in a circle as well as moving around. But it does, because we only see one side, it looks to us like it's not rotating. It actually is. That's a really good question. Okay, hope that Great. helps. Um, and so I think that answers a couple other questions. People were asking, why does the moon move? Um, and um, does the moon does, does the moon move in a pattern? It um, does. So I think, yeah, uh, that um, a lot of moon questions. <laughs> you know what? The moon is easy to see. I mean, it's bright, right? It's easy to find. And if you have binoculars or a little telescope, it's really pretty to look at. So yeah, it's it's just interesting all by itself. Great. We have another question. Okay. What location in the U.S. is the best place to view the stars? what location is the best place to view the stars? There are areas that are called dark sky preserves. Here in Georgia, there's one toward North Georgia, and it's places where, for example, some um, national parks a lot of times have dark sky observing areas, places where there is no city light. I know, for example, here in Atlanta, you've got to get at least 40 miles away from the city of Atlanta to find anything even approaching a dark sky. Um, there are a couple of little pockets here and there, but it's, <laughs> it's harder and harder to find dark sky areas. If you search for that, like Google dark sky areas, there uh, a list of sites comes up. That's a good question too. I have another question, but I was wondering, do we need to screen share the Stellarium right now, just so that um, some of the attendees would like to see the ASL interpreter? Um, oh, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Whichever you like to stop. share. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And so my next question is, um, what is the red smoke be beyond the horse? Ah, good question. It does look like smoke, doesn't it? That's part of another nebula, the one that's behind the horse head nebula. Nebulas are huge, huge, enormous clouds of dust and gas. And you know how neon signs light up different colors? Neon makes a color and sodium makes a color. And uh, depending what gas is in the tube, it makes different colors. Same thing with those elements out there in space. The red is oxygen atoms that are, the term is excited. They're being lit up by the energy of those new stars forming. 
or our stars that are nearby. And so it, it, it does look like red smoke. You're right. Gas glowing is what it is. Okay. And uh, Mary, do you see some other questions that you could shoot to April? Let's see, we'll go into the Q&A. Uh, what would we do without the moon? If the moon did not orbit the earth, what would happen? <laughs> That's a really good question. Anybody a sailor? Tides are formed by the moon. So the moon's gravity pulls on the water on earth, just like earth's gravity pulls on the moon and the whole system keeps itself in rotation and revolution together. So if there were no tides, think of all the biome of tidal pools. There would be a lot of animals, a lot of um, life forms, essentially that depend on tides, marshes, um, wetlands, places where the tide goes in and out and brings nutrients and brings um, different amounts of just simply water here and there. Um, a huge, that would all disappear if we didn't have tides, if we didn't have the moon. The moon was one of the first timekeepers by watching the moon grow from a little crescent up to a full and then shrink up again, that was one of the first ways of telling time. Our word month, just stick an extra O in there, month. Mm -hmm. It's uh, essentially one month for a moon to go through its whole, all of its phases from new around to new again, or first quarter to first quarter. So it was a, we wouldn't have had that timekeeping, which was probably a good thing to have for stretch, um, figuring out you know, when people were first starting to notice things like this, the, everybody depended on either hunting or gathering or raising crops. Most of us don't live any place where there's any way to raise food our own selves, you know, to grow grain or to grow animals or whatever. But that was all really, really important to early farmers watching the moon and knowing what seasons were coming up and paying attention to which star patterns were up in the sky at night was how you kept track of time and knew when to plant and when to harvest and how to stay alive. We, we have another question here. Can we assume that our ancient human ancestors looked at virtually the same sky we see today? Excellent question. And pretty much, yes. I mean, just like Earth is moving around the sun, all the other planets, and the sun is in part of our own Milky Way galaxy, and that's turning as well. And the stars out there are moving as well in relation to each other. They're just so far away that to us, it looks essentially the same as it has been for a thousand years. Good question. Yeah. yeah we have a lot of good questions coming in. So there's another one here. So if we have time, could you explain once again how the earth moves in a certain plane and why all the action seems to be in the southern part of the sky, or at least what we've seen so far. Good question. And it's southern part of the sky because of where we live in the northern hemisphere. If you go into the southern hemisphere, you're going to be looking from a different angle out into space. And all the good stuff happens in the north part of the sky. I know one time I got to go to Australia and I remember thinking to myself as I got off the airplane, the sun is in the north, the sun <laughs> is in the north, the sun is in the north. And I didn't have too much trouble with it. I know some people would, some of the rest of our planetary <laughs> people would stand outside just kind of looking around lost because we were used to the sun across the south part of the sky and there it goes across the north part of the sky. I can try later on if you want, maybe I can find some tools, try something, <laughs> a model or something. Good question. Oh, right. So do you want to move on to the northern part of the sky now? Sure, let's try that. Let's do that. So if you imagine we've been looking at the south part of the sky. So if you're outside looking at the south in your mind, turn yourself around, face the opposite side of the sky. Here we go, past the west, to the north, excellent. Okay, and this is a little bit later tonight, isn't it? 9.30? We're gonna, we're gonna shift our time just a okay. little bit. So we'll go from 7.30 to 9.30. Okay, ooh, it's darker too. Yes. Okay, so find that red N that makes the, marks the direction north. And then look about halfway up the sky and a little bit to the right. 
and see if you can find seven pretty bright stars. And they make a pattern. We call it the Big Dipper. There are four stars, three stars that make a handle and four more stars that make a bowl. Oh, darn, I should have brought my dipper. As a kid, we had that song, um, Follow the Drinking Gourd, and sometimes the Big Dipper is called the Drinking Gourd. And I remember as a child thinking, well, what's a drinking gourd? And there are gourds that are that shape. They've got a big ball and then a sort of a handle part on them. And if you dry them and hollow them out, they can make uh, vessels for carrying water. You know, before there was Walmart to buy paper cups, people used what was out there in nature. And gourds, dried gourds, or sometimes made things out of clay or carved things out of wood. But the drinking gourd was um, a kind of a gourd, essentially. And it's that shape, which is, I suspect, why we call it that. We call it the Big Dipper like for dipping up water. Um, but depending where you grew up, you call it something different. In China, it's seven wise men. In Germany, it's called a wagon, also in France. Um, that seven sages in India. So if you have a handle and a cup, and at this time of year, I remember my mom saying at this time of year, at around 9.30 at night, when the dipper is, the, it looks like it's pouring water down. And if you follow the two stars on the edge of the dipper, not the tail side, but the opposite side, draw a line between those two stars and keep going down toward the horizon in an angle there. And you come to a very famous, not very bright star. Anybody want to take a guess as to what that star might be? So you can type it into the chat if you know. Who is the winner? Yes, the North Star, absolutely. Did the N give it away? Maybe. Uh, the other name for that is Polaris, the pole star. So that's the star where Earth's North Pole is pointing pretty much in that direction out in space. So as Earth rotates, stars appear to move across the sky at night. You've seen the sun do that in the daytime, right? Looks like the sun comes up in the east, goes across the south, sets in the west. Stay up at night. Stars appear to do the same thing. Some look like they rise in the east, move across the south, set in the west. And there are some stars near the North Star that just go around in circles. They're up all night long, any night of the year. The Big Dipper's one set. The Little Dipper is the other set. If you can find that North Star again, that's at the end of the handle of the Little Dipper. The Little Dipper handle is three very faint stars and the cup is even fainter stars. I know where I live, we used to be able to see that. And then some really nice people moved in across the street, but they have this gigantic light, it's supposed to be security, can't see anything in the North sky anymore. But we used to be able to see the North Star and the Little Dipper. And those two appear to sort of swing around each other. Can we do some um, diurnal motion, please? We absolutely can. Watch the Big Dipper. And I'm going to start fast forwarding us through time. Okay, so here we go. Hang on to your seats. We're getting old really fast. The Earth is rotating. Look how the Big Dipper kind of swings around the North Star. But the North Star is not moving. It stays in one spot. Because that's where Earth's North Pole is pointing. Not exactly, but pretty close. So if you're out on the ocean and you're using the stars for navigation, it's nice to have one star that's always in the same place. You can always find it. That one's your North Star and you can figure out where you are on earth and figure out where you're going if you know which way is the North Star. As long as you're north of the equator, you can see that North Star somewhere in the sky. Um, I know where we live here in Georgia, it's much farther down toward the horizon than it was when we lived in Chicago, because it's just that much further south on the Earth. But the North Star is our one star that does not move all night long. So there are a couple, they're called circumpolar constellations, Big Dipper, Little Dipper. And if you follow those two pointer stars from the Dipper, 
go through the North Star and then keep going. There's a little zigzag of stars that makes Cassiopeia the queen. That's another circumpolar constellation. So you can find those any night of the year, any time of the night, if there are no clouds in the way and nobody's security lights. Okay, so we've got the north part of the sky. And remember when we were looking at those um, nebulas that were near Orion, nebulae? If you look at the Big Dipper, off the end of the handle of the Big Dipper, there is a lovely galaxy called the Whirlpool Galaxy. And we're gonna zoom in and take a look at that. Thank you. Here it comes. Now to see this one, you're gonna need a really, really big telescope. And you might even want to have one of those um, telescopes that has a camera attached. Human eyes see light and forget, see and forget, see and forget. Otherwise you'd be blinded with light all the time. So your, <clears throat> excuse me, your eyes adapt and you can see. Well, if you're looking at a little far away, hard to see image, it's, it helps to have a, a telescope that can collect up the light and save it like on film or on a CCD camera, something that you can take a nice picture of it. The Hubble Space Telescope has taken some really nice pictures of this M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. M51, that um, nebula that was in near Orion's uh, belt, the M42. The M stands for Messier. Um, in the 1700s, when telescopes were being built bigger and bigger, and people were searching for comets so they could win prizes, um, Monsieur Messier in France started a list of all the little fuzzy things that he found while he was looking around the sky that were not comets. So this is number 51 on his list. It's a galaxy right close. To, well, it looks like it's close to the edge of the Big Dipper's handle there. Okay, let me check chat here. Looks like a lot going on. Yes, there's a lot going on in the chat. So I'll let you do that first and then we'll go to the Q&A section. Okay, let's see, move back to some more constellations. Was that okay? Do we need more constellations? Stargazing, your museum, excellent. Caption, been lucky enough to be in rural Maine, dark sky. Oh, full moon was so bright you could walk by. It was painful to look at. Thank you, Carol. Boy, that's true. Okay. Okay. Let's see what Q&A has here. Mm -hmm. oh, so we do have two questions about planets that are, okay. and that's going to be coming up pretty soon in your presentation. Okay. Um, could we answer the question of why moonrise time varies so much? You were saying earlier how the full moon rises at sunset and sets at sunrise. Right. Well, why don't we see the other moon phases rising and setting at those times too? An excellent question. So think about when we were looking at the moon tonight and then we moved forward and looked at tomorrow and then the next night and the next night. Each night the moon had moved along its orbit a little bit, about 13 degrees. So if you stand outside and you look at where the moon is and you line up, okay, this is where it is at seven o'clock. And then tomorrow night you go out and look, oops, moon's over here. We have to wait for the earth to turn a little bit more, about another hour, and let us catch up to where the moon was positionally to where it was the night before. So each night it rises about an hour later. So that's why at different rise times for the moon. Good question. All right. Another question is, how does the moon do all those things that you're talking about? How does the moon do those things? Really good question. Um, I think it's us that are doing those things. We watch and we notice things. We notice that the moon appears sometimes like tonight, a little bit more than a crescent, but not quite full. You watch, you watch, you watch. Different amounts of light, the lighted up side of the moon face Earth as the moon is moving along its orbit. So sometimes the side of the moon that has the light on it, sometimes we call it the dark side, but it's really the other backside of the moon. That's when the moon is new. We don't see it. The sunlight is shining on the uh, backside. Then the moon moves along its orbit a little bit and that lit up side, a teeny, teeny little crescent, like an eyelash shows up. The next night, it's a little bit thicker. 
and a little bit higher in the sky. Next night looks a little bit fatter. We're just seeing more of the lit up side or less. After the full moon, it looks like the moon shrinks down again. And so we're seeing less of that lit up side. It's all gravity and the earth in rotation and the moon in revolution around the earth that makes it do those things, which is kind of nice that it does. It's pretty to look at. Good all question. Right. Very good questions. Okay, so the next two kind of go together. How do you distinguish between planets and stars and can we identify Venus? So what would you like to do? Yeah, let's, yeah, let's go forward in time to about 5.30 tomorrow morning with our Stellarium. All right. And that's a really good question. How do you figure out planets and stars? Technically, and I remember, golly, this is terrible. When I was first learning how to do this stuff in the planetarium, somebody said to me, well, how many of the stars are planets? My science brain said, none of the stars are planets. Stars make their own light. Planets reflect starlight, in our case, reflect sunlight. That's how you can see Venus in the early, early morning sky. Ooh, there it is. Now we're gonna face the Eastern part of the sky, Southeastern part of the sky. So quite a lot of time has gone by. Orion and friends, those have all gone down in the West. We can't see those anymore. And the moon also would have set by now. So this is early, early in the morning. And see those two spots in between the Southeast and East part of the sky? Other planets in our solar system. One of them closer to the sun than Earth is, that's Venus. A little one, the other one a little bit farther away, that one's Mars. Notice how close they are to the horizon there. Where I live, there are trees that stick up pretty high. I have not yet seen Venus in the early morning sky, even though I've been looking for a week to try to find it uh, just before the sun comes up. So what I'm gonna have to do is just <laughs> have a little more patience, wait a little bit longer, let the sky clear up. Venus looks like a really, really, I mean, really bright star. In fact, if you go outside on any given night, just around sunset or around sunrise, and in the south part of the sky, some incredibly bright object, it's probably a planet. Some stars are really pretty bright, like Sirius is really pretty bright, but Venus is much, much brighter than that. It's closer for one thing. Sunlight is reflecting off the tops of the clouds around Venus, so it looks really bright. Mars, a little bit farther from the sun, no clouds. So it does reflect light, but instead of nice shiny cloud tops, we've got red dusty dirt, soil on the surface and rocks. That doesn't reflect quite as much light. Plus the sunlight spread out quite a bit by the time it gets out beyond earth. So if, you're, uh, if you um, watch night after night after night after night at some bright thing, if it's a planet, it will wander along the background stars, mostly traveling toward the east from where it is. And then if it's something like Jupiter, occasionally it looks like it stops and turns around and goes back, kind of gives you the impression that, oh yeah, that's not a star. Oh, here we go. The moon has moved. <laughs> I thought there was a comet coming through. <laughs> That's what I don't know. So you can see how um, Venus and Mars and even Saturn's joined in the fun there. That one's way far away. So by, ooh, middle of April, early, early, early in the morning. Boy, wouldn't this be great to see all four, two really, really big planets and two smaller ones all in a line. That line, that's part of that ecliptic that we were talking about earlier, the plane of Earth's orbit. So, <clears throat> excuse me, if you think of yourself, oh golly, am I dating myself? Remember a phonograph record? A CD, if you don't remember that. Stand in the hole in the center and look out across the surface of your phonograph record or your CD, <clears throat> compact disc. And a lot the planets are all sitting on that surface. They're all in the same plane, as it were. I hope that makes sense. Somebody correct me if it doesn't. Please. So if you see a bright object and, it, and over a couple of weeks, it moves against the background stars, that's a planet. If it stays in the same, like the stars of Orion, 
like Betelgeuse is never going to go wandering off in some direction. It always stays in the same place in the constellation, in the pattern. Planets are the ones that move against background stars. Hope that helps. Let's see what chat has to say here. All right, so I'm going to stop the share. Would that be considered a syzygy? Ooh, isn't that a lovely word? Have you ever tried that one for Scrabble? Which it doesn't fit. There aren't enough C's. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, it's the lining up like that is called a syzygy, yes. All right, so I think we have time maybe for another question or two before we have to wrap up. So okay. in the Q&A, we have some questions here um, asking about is if Pluto is on a different plane from the other planets? Mm -hmm. Slightly, it's tipped slightly more than the other planets. Um, 30, no, not even 30 degrees, 20, I think, 19, something like that. So it is slightly off the rest of the um, plant, the plane, but there's a like a thick torus, like a donut of Kuiper belt objects. Pluto's one, Makemake. Make. Um, there are a bunch of, Eris is another one. There are lots of objects, we're just starting to find them now since we have good enough telescopes and places to look. So, uh, but there's a whole belt of objects, kind of like the asteroid belt that's between Mars and Jupiter. They're not flat like a plate exactly. They're more thick like a donut of asteroids. They're a little bit up and down in the ecliptic, if that makes sense. And I'm gonna combine two questions together. Okay. Um, will the James Webb Space Telescope be able to see into a nebula and how much percentage have humans explored space? We'll, we'll say with telescopes rather than with ourselves. Oh, that's an excellent question. Yeah. What we have explored with telescopes is teeny. I mean, we've done pretty well on our solar system, but there is so much space and we're, kind of small and we are sitting in one planet and we have a couple of telescopes and we're looking, I mean, there are only, there, there are not thousands and thousands and thousands of people with thousands and thousands and thousands of telescopes, right? There are a couple of really big ones and there are people using those, but, and you have to wait, I mean, <laughs> you could watch every night for a year and you would see all the stars that you can see from your spot on Earth. Okay, and then take yourself 2,000 miles north or south, south actually, and you'd see a whole different set of stars if you watched all year. And space, like I said earlier, it's really, really big, mostly empty, but it's good. there are lots of good things to look for anyway. And the James Webb Space Telescope, that's going to be looking at infrared light, like heat light. So it Exactly. We'll be able to look through the dust of nebulae and look at the radiation that we can't see with our eyes. And isn't that fabulous that that's up and running and made it to its Lagrangian point? They've been yes, waiting I'm a long time. Really excited about its first images that we're going to be able to see in July. So that's mm -hmm. going to be a great thing to, to talk about too. Um, unfortunately, I think we are now out of time. So uh -huh. I want to thank both April and Shelley for being here tonight. If anyone has any additional questions, April, where can they reach you? Where could who could they email or send their their questions to? Okay, Fernbank Science Center. If you um, just um, write question at Fernbank Science Center or fsc.edu, um, those uh, they'll answer the questions there. Um, I think Mary has my email address if you want to contact her and I'll be glad to answer questions if you send them. Put something about um, the Newark Museum question in the subject line so it doesn't get buried someplace. Um, and if you go to Fernbank's website, fernbank.edu or fsc.fernbank.edu, that has um, the information about the observatory and when it's going to be open. And is your observatory going to be open at all, Mary? Soon, do you know? Oh, we don't have an observatory oh, at the oh, museum. Oh, oh, we right, have a planetarium. Okay. That's yes. right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, hopefully our planetarium but, will reopen soon for the yeah. public. Yeah. But that, that is a good segue because we are open to the public now. Not only the museum, but the planetarium has finally reopened. So we have shows on Saturdays at 11, 2, and 3. They are free with admission. So you can come uh, see me this weekend, uh, this Saturday, running shows at those times. 
Uh, and if you have more questions, you can ask them there too. Uh, but we do have some other upcoming programs along with the planetarium reopening. We have Cardboard Rocket and Origins of Life, but also we have our Art After Dark Street Art Face Off, which is Thursday, March 10th. So that is tomorrow night at 7 p.m. So you can get tickets on our website. We're going to be celebrating uh, street art in the Brick City way. So join us in person at the museum for activities and performances. All right. So I, again, want to thank uh, April and uh, Shelly and Imani all for being a part of our program today. I've had such a pleasant time being here with our audience and with all of you as well. Again, if your question was not answered during our program, go ahead and send them to the Newark Museum and we can will forward them on to April or you can contact them directly at fernbank.edu and uh, find a way to contact them there too. I just bumped my computer there. Okay, so with that, we hope that you enjoyed our stargazing program for tonight and encourage you to bundle up wherever you are, go outside and look up to see what you can find on the next clear night. So good night, everybody. Oh, uh, shoot, I'm trying to answer a question. <laughs> Oh, that's okay. That's all right. You can continue to do so. Uh, yeah, Janet had a question about how does the Earth's reflective property compare? We don't have, we're not completely covered with clouds all the time, like Venus, but we're not completely covered with dirt either, right? Three quarters of the Earth's surface is covered with water. That's nicely reflective. In fact, if you could stand on Mars and look back toward the Earth at the right moon phase, it would look like two dots, two bright things right next to each other, moon and earth. So we're pretty shiny. Good question. All right, Let's see if there's some more here. All right, thank you everybody. So yeah, we, we're gonna have to log off now because it is eight. So April, any questions we have left, we will go ahead and forward to you and hopefully we'll have everybody's emails and you can respond back to them, okay? Thank you so All much, right. it's been fun. Right. Thank you.